Predator is kind of all about the alien. Yeah. And, and this movie is all about these people and then this, this situation. A couple of things about this. The the Predator was after this. And, uh, oh, yeah. Governor, Governor Schwarzenegger actually has said on numerous occasions that they saw without warning and that was their inspiration for the Predator. And the actor, Kevin Hall, who played the Predator in our movie, also played the Predator in the Predator. Wow. So the same guy, the seven foot tall guy, very nice guy. And uh, He's so, on the speed dial for the seven yeah, foot tall guy. I guess so. So uh, uh, there's that uh, 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 in common. And uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of all that I've done. Uh, it seems to hold up well and most people like it. It holds up very well and it's still scary, which is amazing because the film is what, we do the math here, what, 30 years old? Oh, almost, it's 28 actually. Wow. And uh, Jack Palance, I had worked with him once before, and this was the first film I worked with Marty Landau. Um, Academy Award winning Martin Landau. Yeah, as did Jack Palance, or was Jack Palance. Right, Jack Palance as well. Uh, both exceptionally nice to work with, uh, and as you may have seen, David Caruso, <laughs> it was his first film. He looks about 15 and pudgy. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we, we shot it in the Los Angeles area, most of it at night. We shot on 15 day schedule. Wow. And the budget was $150,000 all in, including seventy five for Palance and Landau. Wow. So uh, well, they brought a lot to it. They did. They did. Uh, I've been fortunate, and I always tried to work with whenever I could, very, very experienced <laughs> actors. Because they, they do, as you say, bring a lot to the role. And, uh, but both Palace and Landau were very cooperative with the younger actors. They would work with them. And, and I remember the scene in the uh, gas station at the, beginning of, at the beginning of the picture where the four kids are there and, and uh, Palance. Jack Palance comes out you know, and they have their conversation. David Caruso, as I said, it was his first film. And he was kind of standing behind Palance and doing this, you know, Palance is crazy type thing. And during the rehearsal, Jack looked back and he said to me, Great, is this guy going to be doing this? So I go to David Caruso and I said, David, what, 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 what are we doing here? And he said, Well, I kind of think this guy's crazy. And Palance said, oh, oh, that's good. Let's use that. So Palance worked really well with the, the uh, young actor. That's wonderful. And, and the, actually, the, the other male lead, he's very familiar. I don't know if we've seen him. You know, this is unbelievable. The two young people that were the actual leads never worked again. Are you kidding me? Unbelievable. Uh, uh, that's uh, too bad. The, the, the young lady, Tara Nutter, had uh, starred for Ron Howard in, I think, probably the only made-for-TV movie he did with Art Carney, something about... Uh, uh, a farmer in the Midwest and he's losing his crops and she played his daughter. That's how she first came to my attention. And the young man had done a couple of things. Um, was, uh, he, was he in Shazam? I don't know. Okay, because he know. looked like a kid from Shazam. But uh, uh, much to my surprise, neither of them literally ever worked again. Uh, David Caruso, he, he worked on occasion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen a little bit of David Caruso. Actually, I've seen more of David Caruso than I really like to see. <laughs> At least his physical body, anyway. Actually, Caruso was um, an interesting actor. As I said in the scene with Palance, you know, he was very creative, and Palance worked with that. But uh, he was very, very inexperienced, and he's given a couple of interviews about Without Warning. And a lot of actors who maybe started in low budget horror, sci-fi stuff, they knock their films. Caruso does not. <laughs> Caruso, well, that's that is class, yes. Caruso said he was very happy to get the role, it got him into SAG, and he remarked how nice Palance and Landau were. Uh, so, you know, it's, like you say, it's class for me. The other thing I'd like to talk to you about uh, with this movie, and it seems maybe a recurrent theme in your films, uh, perhaps uh, the effect of the Vietnam War, or the effect of war in general, or the military? Well, uh, yeah, I've always been kind of a political guy with strong opinions. And uh, I didn't necessarily consciously put uh, political things in films, but uh, when you look at a lot of my stuff, it does refer to that. And uh, Palance's character, whose name incidentally is in this movie is Fred Dobbs, for those of you who no film. Humphrey Bogart
Stark's character in Children of the Saramandre, Fred Dunn. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Wow. Well, uh, another thing about this movie that, that I think is a you know, a lot of movies of this era and of this type, especially under kind of shooting schedule, are shot mostly at night and in the woods. Yeah. But you, you can really see all of the action. You can follow everything that's happening. I mean, there's so many of these movies from this era. I remember at the driving going, what was going on for half of that movie? It's all in the dark. I mean, did you have a just crack lighting guys or, or you know, with good luck or how did that turn out? I, uh, I think this was the seventh film that I made, and uh, six of the seven, not my first one, but after that, I had, was very fortunate to have a cameraman by the name of Dean Cundy. Now, yeah, he, de he definitely deserves applause. Dean made Halloween, oh, which wow. he made just before we shot this. Then he went on and, you know, he's worked, uh, well, he did Jurassic Park, he did uh, Back to the Futures, a fantastic, fantastic cameraman. He gave an interview not too long ago and someone said, you know, how great he was to work on Jurassic Park and what have you. He said, yeah, I also worked for Graydon Clark, he did Satan's Cheerleaders. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, Dean was very good, very fast. Obviously, if you're shooting in 15 days, you have to be fast. Most of it, uh, as you know, was uh, shot at night. Uh, and it was cold for Los Angeles. Uh, we would scrape the ice off our windows when we were leaving in the morning. Uh, shot at what is now known as the Paramount Ranch. Uh, it used to be owned by Paramount, now I think it's owned by the state, and they allow filmmakers to come in at a very reasonable price. So the locations worked for us. First, we built the thing that we blew up, and I don't know if you guys are interested, but when you do something like that, you build it out of called Celotex, it's really like cardboard, it's, okay. not, it's not a real wood, and you can't let them nail it together because when you explode it, the nails go flying oh, wow. and stain, so it's all glued together. My special effects guy said to me, how big do you want the explosion to be? And I said, well, Harry, his nickname, Harry Three Fingers, <laughs> because he had blown to him, that's true. I said, well, Harry, I want it to be as big as the guy over there will let us, and that was the fireman on the set. So he made it big, and it was a nice explosion. Pretty nice end. explosion, and, and, and enhanced very well by the editing of the film. Thank you. A lot of times when that's done, it seems extended, but it didn't seem extended. It just seemed effective, like it was a really big explosion. Well, obviously, you only blow it once, but I think we had three. I would have liked to have had ten. We had three cameras on it, so you could go from various angles. Intercut them so it looks like a longer and bigger. Explosion. And there was an interesting credit on the music where it was like electronic enhancement or yeah, something. Kind yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy who did the music for me. Uh, he he went on and he did a number of films and then he the last oh, 10, 15 years he's been teaching uh, film music at UCLA. Dan Wyman was his name. And uh, this is one of the first electronic scores. Uh, it was the first electronic score on any of my films and one one of the first in. So he would sit at the keyboard and make all the music that you heard. It was very good. It was very effective. And, and it also another thing that they, you might, I would like to hear a comment on. It was, the film was really effective, and you don't really see the main alien until the very end of the picture. And, and really, again, it's not about the alien. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, but so many films today are kind of like they pay off in the first 10 minutes, and, and they try to keep that climax going for the whole movie. And you get tired of everything by the end of it. So, I mean, do you have a comment about that as far as how movies are made today versus versus this kind of a build-up in, in a movie? Well, I think that if you give a taste to the audience of something, then they'll stay with you and you give them a little more and a little more and a little more. And because we had these little flying suckers that went out, you know, <laughs> and they, they did this thing, and we show those early on yeah. with uh, Cameron Mitchell when he gets it in the back of the uh, neck here and you know it goes into his skin and so forth that was quite effective and that set up the fright the horror so we didn't need to 